1.1 Planet Earth. Definitions. To start topic 1.1, you need to know some definitions. In the specification, they're in the middle of the topic, but really you need to know them before starting. So, here we go. The poles are located at the intersection of the Earth's axes of rotation and the Earth's surface. The poles are the northern and southern ends of the Earth's axis of rotation. The equator is an imaginary line on the surface of Earth that is equidistant, so equal distances, from the poles. The equator divides the Earth into two equal halves, the northern and the southern hemispheres. Lines of latitude are parallel lines that circle the Earth from east to west. They are parallel with the equator as well as each other. The tropics are lines of latitude plus and minus 23.5 degrees from the equator. The Tropic of Cancer is plus 23.5 degrees from the equator, whereas the Tropic of Capricorn is minus 23.5. It's important that you remember the plus and minus 23.5 degrees. Meridian. A meridian is an imaginary line that runs north to south and passes through a given place on Earth. This place could be a specific place, or it could just be where you are now. Lines of longitude go from north to south. The lines of longitude are not parallel, as they intersect at the north and south poles. Zero degrees longitude is called the prime meridian. It is like the equator for lines of latitude. The prime meridian goes through Greenwich in London, so it's sometimes called the Greenwich meridian. The horizon is the line where the Earth's surface and the sky appear to meet from an observer's point of view. Zenith. A zenith is a point in the night sky directly above the observer. A zenith is always 90 degrees from the observer's horizon. It is literally a point in the night sky directly above their head. That's it. One. What distinguishes Earth from other planets? Earth has an atmosphere of mainly oxygen and nitrogen. Some planets have no atmosphere, other planets have atmospheres with different compositions. Earth also has liquid water covering about 70% of its surface. Earth also has life in all its diverse forms. Earth is the only planet we know that definitely has life on it. 2. Why is the sky blue? If the Earth had no atmosphere, then the sun would appear white on a black background. A bit like this, and a bit like the sun does from the moon. But the Earth does have an atmosphere, and the atmosphere scatters the light. This means that the light interacts with the particles in the atmosphere, and they are moved off course. So sunlight comes in from the sun, interacts with the particles and is moved off course. But remember that white light is made of all the colours in the spectrum. Blue light, which has the shortest wavelength, is scattered much more than red, which has the longest wavelength. Green, which is in the middle, is scattered in the middle. So what happens is, is that the blue light scattered the most, the green a bit less, and the red hardly at all. This is why the sky appears blue, because when we look at the sky, we see blue light that has been scattered all around. However, we see all these other colours when we look directly at the sun. This is why the sky appears blue and the sun appears white, well a little yellow, because the blue has been taken out a little bit. 3. How does the atmosphere benefit us? The ozone layer absorbs harmful ultraviolet radiation, which causes accelerated skin ageing and cancer. The atmosphere also absorbs harmful x-rays and gamma rays, which cause radiation poisoning and ultimately death, so the atmosphere really is quite handy. The atmosphere also regulates the temperature of Earth and prevents us from getting extreme temperatures. This is why the surface temperature on Earth is usually between negative 90 and positive 60 degrees Celsius. The atmosphere also provides us oxygen, which allows us to breathe. And finally, it protects us from meteoroids, since the majority of them burn up in the atmosphere. Shooting stars are just meteors burning up in the atmosphere. 4. 
drawbacks of the atmosphere for astronomers. The atmospheric turbulence. The refraction of light as it passes through the Earth's turbulent atmosphere causes stars to twinkle. So it restricts the resolution of stellar images. By the way, stellar means star. The scattering of the shorter blue wavelengths of light make the sky blue at daytime, preventing any astronomical observations. If there was no atmosphere, you could observe all the time. Because the atmosphere absorbs or reflects most of the electromagnetic spectrum, observatories for UV, X-rays and gamma rays are required to be on high mountains or on satellites in space. 5. Light pollution. Astronomical observations are hindered by a form of light pollution called sky glow. Sky glow is caused by light that comes from lights on the ground. The waste light shines up and causes the orange haze that prevents the faint stars from being observed. This sky glow happens mainly around urban areas. This is why the countryside is the best place to observe stars, even though some sky glow can be present from the nearest towns and cities. So what are the sources of light pollution? Well, we have floodlights, like those used in sports and on astroturfs and that sort of thing. We have street lamps and motorway lights. These litter our roads in Britain and they cause light pollution. We also have security lights, which are used on houses and industrial buildings. All of these cause light pollution. There are two types of light pollution, indirect and direct. Indirect happens because the light from these light sources reflects off the ground and back into the sky. Direct happens when the light from these light sources goes straight into the sky. Both of these cause the orange haze or sky glow. 6. Eratosthenes' calculation of the circumference of the Earth. Eratosthenes was a Greek living in Alexandria, which is in Egypt, in the 3rd century BC. Eratosthenes was the first person to accurately calculate the circumference of the Earth. So how did he do it? Eratosthenes read an account that said at noon on the summer solstice, the columns of temples cast no shadows at a place called Syene, which was on the Tropic of Cancer. On the same date, also at noon, so at the same time, at Alexandria, a stick cast a shadow of seven degrees measured from the top of the stick. Later, Eratosthenes learnt that Sine was 790 kilometres further south than Alexandria. How he knew this is up to much debate, however, we just have to trust him. Assuming that the light from the sun is parallel, and using alternate angles, Eratosthenes could calculate what fraction of the circumference the 790 kilometres between Alexandria and Syene was. Using alternate angles, he found that the, the angle between Alexandria and Syene would also be 7 degrees. So, 360 divided by 7, which is the angle between Alexandria and Syene, gives us a 51st of a circle. So the 790 kilometres is a 51st of all the way around the Earth, which is the circumference. So, 790 times 51 gives us the length around the whole circle, the circumference, which came out as 40,290 kilometres. 7. The diameter of Earth. Now this should be easy, but not quite. For GCSE, you need to know that the Earth is an oblate spheroid. Okay, so an oblate spheroid is a normal sphere like this, but it has been squashed at the poles. A bit like this, but less extreme. So the diameter of Earth is measured at the equator, which is the longest length around the Earth. The reason the Earth is an oblate spheroid is because it is spinning, and the parts of the Earth furthest from the axis of rotation are pushed out more. The diameter of the Earth around the equator is 13,000 kilometers, so that's the number you need to know. You also need to know that the Earth is an oblate spheroid. 8. 
the Earth is nearly a sphere. Well, as we talked about earlier, it's in fact an oblate spheroid. But what the specification wants you to know here is that the Earth is definitely not flat. So what is the evidence for the Earth being spherical? Ish. So we have photos, photos taken from space of Earth, and they show that it's a sphere. Eratosthenes, he calculated its circumference. We also know that it's a sphere because of the horizon. Ships and buildings all disappear over the horizon. This would not happen on a flat Earth. We've seen the Earth's shadow on the lunar eclipse, and when we observe the Earth's shadow, it's round. The other point is that stars rise at time, different times all across the world. This couldn't happen unless the Earth was a sphere. And again, time. Different places on Earth are at different times, all at the same time. So noon in one place, it may be noon in one place, but it may not be noon in another. This can only happen again if the Earth is spherical. There are others, but just use those in the exam. 9. The Earth's rotational period. A rotational period is the time it takes to do one full rotation, so it's a day. Well, a, a sidereal day. There are two types of day, sidereal and solar. Sidereal just means to do with stars and solar to do with the sun. A sidereal day is Earth's rotational period. It's the time it takes the Earth to do one full rotation. A sidereal day is also the same time it takes for the stars to return exactly back to the same position. So if you looked up and saw a star directly above you, 23 hours and 56 minutes later, the same star would be directly above you. A solar day is different to a sidereal day because the Earth is orbiting the Sun. The solar day is the time it takes between the Sun to return to exactly the same point. The reason why a sidereal and solar day is different is because in the time that it has taken the Earth to do one rotation, the Earth has moved a little bit further along in its orbit around the Sun. Therefore, the part of the, that part of the Earth no longer points towards the Sun, and so to do so it takes another four minutes. So a solar day is 24 hours. For the exam you need to know that the Earth's rotational period is 23 hours and 56 minutes, and that it takes nearly exactly four minutes for the Earth to rotate one degree, as this is the time difference between sidereal and solar days. 10. Types of telescope. There are two main types of telescope, refracting and reflecting. Refracting telescopes work much like a camera lens, and have a glass convex lens which focuses light onto an eyepiece, a little bit like this. Reflectors have a curved mirror, and that collects light and focuses it onto an eyepiece. The lens or mirror is called the objective, and the size of the telescope is referring to the diameter of the objective. The bigger the diameter, the better the telescope. Larger telescopes, like the one on top of Mauna Kea in Hawaii, have major advantages over smaller ones. For example, they collect more light in proportion to the area. For example, a 10-metre telescope collects 25 times the light of a 2-metre telescope. This is because a 10-metre telescope is 5 times larger than a 2-metre telescope, and you square the 5 to make 25. The reason you square the 5 is because the area of a circle is pi r squared, so as the telescope size increases, the area increases to the power of 2. This gives you higher resolution images, because more light is entering the telescope, so fainter objects don't have to be observed for so long. Larger telescopes use reflectors, um, because large mirrors can be manufactured to higher precision than large lenses. And large lenses are also very heavy and therefore difficult to support. This is why all large telescopes are reflectors rather than refractors. 11. The atmosphere's effect on radiation. 
There are different things in the atmosphere that block different parts of the electromagnetic spectrum. For example, gamma, UV and X-rays are totally blocked by the atmosphere, with most infrared being absorbed as well. For visible light, microwaves and some radio waves, the story is different, as the atmosphere is transparent to these parts of the spectrum, and they pass through to sea level. However, most observatories that are infrared or visible are located on top of high mountains to improve picture quality, as this reduces the amount of atmosphere above the observatory. And remember that the atmosphere is a bit irritating for astronomers, it causes stars to twinkle and reduces quality. However, because ultraviolet and X-rays do not penetrate the atmosphere at all, these telescopes need to be located above the atmosphere in space. Now, you need to know which chemicals in the atmosphere stop which types of electromagnetic radiation. Let's start with the shortest wavelengths, gamma and X-rays. Gamma and X-rays are stopped by nitrogen and oxygen in the atmosphere, so they do not penetrate far. Ultraviolet, or UV, is stopped by ozone and oxygen. Infrared is stopped by water, carbon dioxide and methane. The shorter microwaves, which are stopped, are stopped by water and oxygen. And the longer radio waves, which are stopped, are reflected by the ionosphere. So you need to remember these for your exam. Twelve. The Van Allen Belts. Surrounding the Earth, there are two Van Allen Belts, which are also called radiation belts, as they are rings of high energy particles that are from the solar wind and held in place by Earth's magnetic field. The outer belt consists of mainly electrons and has an altitude between 3 and 10 Earth radii. The um, R with a subscript E means Earth radii. So, the diameter of belt is 3 to 10 times that of the Earth's radius. The inner belt is dominated by high energy protons and has an altitude of around 0.2 to 2 Earth radii. These Van Allen belts are very high in radiation. So how were the radiation belts discovered? The radiation belts were actually discovered separately, the inner belt, in January 1958 by a Geiger counter which measures radiation on Explorer 1. Late the same year, in December 1958, the belt, outer belt was discovered. This was on a spacecraft called Pioneer 3. If you just remember these key facts, that's what you need to know about how the Van Allen belts were discovered.